Welcome to Sleepy Eyes. I am your host, Varga. I take you on a journey in the dark of the night with warm tales. Take a moment to relax your body and mind with the current calmness. Breathe deeply, feel the energy inside, and let go of any tiredness. Put aside the past and focus on the peacefulness of the present moment. Recognize any tension in your body. Allow it to fade away and unwind. Discover your inner peace and simply unwind in the tranquility of now. Before going to sleep, prepare to read a story comfortably in this peaceful setting. Let the magic of words captivate you as you get lost in a tale or story. With the warmth from this peace and relaxation, your sleep will become even more serene. Close your eyes, embark on a journey with a touch of words. Let each word guide you a bit deeper toward the essence of your inner peace. Now, relax and enjoy the pleasure of getting lost in the enchanting world of the story before drifting into sleep. Sherlock Holmes Short Stories Writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Man with the Twisted Lip Part 2 On Monday, June the 15th Then, Mr. Holmes, how do you explain this letter that I have received from him today? Sherlock Holmes jumped out of his chair. What? he shouted. Yes, today. Smiling, she held up an envelope. May I see it? Certainly. In his eagerness, he seized it from her quite rudely, smoothed it out on the table, and examined it very thoroughly. I looked at it over his shoulder. The envelope was a cheap one, and it had been posted at Gravesend in Kent earlier in the day. The handwriting on the envelope is poor, said Holmes. Surely this is not your husband's writing, Mrs. St. Clair. No, but the letter inside is in his handwriting. I see that whoever addressed the envelope had to go and find out your address. How can you tell that? The name, you see, is in perfectly black ink and has been allowed to dry slowly. The address is almost grey, which proves that sand has been thrown on the writing to dry it. The man who wrote this envelope wrote the name first, and then paused for some time before writing the address. The only explanation is that he did not know it, but let us look at the letter. Ah, some object has been enclosed in this. Yes, said Mrs. St. Clair, there was a ring, Neville's ring. And are you sure that this is in your husband's writing? Yes, though it's easy to see that he wrote it in a great hurry. This is what the letter said. Dearest Olivia, do not be frightened. Everything will be all right. There is a mistake that it will take some time to put right. Wait patiently. Neville. This, said Holmes, is written in pencil on a page torn from some book. It was posted by a man with a dirty thumb, and whoever closed the envelope had a lump of tobacco in his mouth. Well, Mrs. St. Clair, things are beginning to seem a little more hopeful but I do not think the danger is over yet. But Neville must be alive, Mr. Holmes, unless this letter is the work of a clever man. After all, the ring proves nothing. It may have been taken from him. No, no, that's certainly his own handwriting. Very well, but the letter may have been written on Monday and only posted today. That is possible. If that is so, many things may have happened between the two days. Oh, you must not make me lose hope, Mr. Holmes. I know that Neville is all right. Our relationship is such a strong one that I always know when he has an accident. On that last morning, he cut himself in the bedroom, and although I was in the dining room, I knew immediately that something had happened to him. I rushed upstairs and found that I was right. Do you think I could possibly not know about it if he had been murdered? But if your husband is alive and able to write letters, why should he remain away from you? I can't imagine. And on Monday he said nothing unusual before leaving home. Nothing. And you were surprised to see him at that window in Upper Swandam Street? Yes, extremely surprised. Was the window open? Yes. Then he could have spoken to you? 
He could, but he only cried out as if he were calling for help, and he waved his hands. But it might have been a cry of surprise. Shock at the sight of you might cause him to throw up his hands. It is possible. But I thought he was pulled back from the window. He might have jumped back. You did not see anyone else in the room, did you? No. But that ugly cripple admitted that he was there, and the owner of the place was at the foot of the stairs. Did your husband seem to be wearing his ordinary clothes? Yes, but he had no collar or tie on. I saw the skin of his throat quite clearly. Had he ever mentioned Upper Swandam Street to you? Never. Had he ever shown any signs of having taken opium? No, never. Thank you, Mrs. St. Clair. We will now have a little supper and then go to bed. We may have a very busy day tomorrow. But Holmes did not go to bed that night. He was a man who sometimes stayed awake for a whole week when he was working on one of his cases. He filled his pipe. Then he sat down, crossed his legs, and looked with fixed eyes at the ceiling. I was already in bed and soon went to sleep. Holmes was still smoking when I woke up next morning. It was a bright sunny day, but the room was full of tobacco smoke. Are you awake, Watson? Yes. Would you like to come for an early morning drive? All right. Then get dressed. Nobody is up yet, but I know where the servant who looks after the horses sleeps. We shall soon have the carriage on the road. Holmes laughed to himself as he spoke. He seemed to be a different man from the Holmes of the night before. As I dressed, I looked at my watch. It was not surprising that nobody in the house was up. It was only 4.25. Soon Holmes came back and told me that the carriage was ready. I want to test a little idea of mine, he said as he put his shoes on. I think, Watson, that I am the most stupid man in Europe. I deserve to be kicked from here to London, but I think I have found the explanation of Neville Sinclair's disappearance now. Yes, Watson, I think I have the key to the mystery. And where is it? I asked, smiling. In the bathroom, he answered. Oh yes, I am not joking, he went on, seeing the surprise on my face. I have been there, and I have taken it out, and I have it in this bag. Come on, Watson, and let us see whether this key is the right one. The carriage was waiting for us in the bright morning sunshine. We both jumped in, and the horse rushed off along the London road. A few country vehicles were about, taking fruit to the London markets, but the houses on either side of the road were as silent and lifeless as in a dream. Oh, I have been blind, Watson, said Holmes, but it is better to learn wisdom late than never to learn it at all. In London, a few people were beginning to look out sleepily from their windows as we drove through the streets on the south side of the city. We went down Waterloo Bridge Road and across the river, then along Wellington Street. We stopped at Bow Street Police Station. The two policemen at the door touched their hats to Holmes, who was well known there. One of them looked after the horse while the other led us in. Who is the officer on duty this morning? asked Holmes. Mr. Bradstreet, sir, answered the man. A large, fat man came down the passage just then. Ah, Bradstreet, how are you? said Holmes. I'd like to have a word with you. Certainly, Mr. Holmes, let us go into my room. It was a small office, with a desk and a telephone. Bradstreet sat down. What can I do for you, Mr. Holmes? I am here in connection with Hugh Boone, the beggar, the man who has been charged with involvement in the disappearance of Mr. Neville St. Clair. Yes, we are still busy with that case. You have Boone here? Yes, he's locked up. Is he quiet? Oh, he gives no trouble, but he's a dirty man. Dirty? Yes. He doesn't mind washing his hands, but his face is as black as a coal miner's. Well, as soon as his case is settled, he'll have to have a proper prison bath. I should very much like to see him. Would you? That can easily be arranged. Come this way. You can leave your bag here. No, I think I'll take it with me. Very good. Come this way, please. 
He led us down a passage, opened a barred door, and took us down some stairs to another white passage. There was a row of doors on each side. The third door on the right is his, said Bradstreet. Here it is. He looked through a hole in the upper part of the door. He's asleep. You can see him very well. Holmes and I both looked through the hole. The prisoner lay with his face towards us in a very deep sleep, breathing slowly and heavily. He was a man of medium height, dressed in a torn coat and a colored shirt. As Bradstreet had said, he was extremely dirty. One side of his top lip was turned up, so that three teeth were showing. He looked like an angry dog. His head was covered almost down to the eyes with very bright red hair. He's a beauty, isn't he? said Bradstreet. He certainly needs a wash, Holmes replied. I had an idea that he might be dirty, and so I brought this with me. He took a wet cloth out of his bag. What a funny man you are, Mr. Holmes, laughed Bradstreet. Now, Bradstreet, open that door as quietly as possible, please. All right. And Bradstreet slipped his big key into the lock, and we all went in very quietly. The sleeping man half turned and then settled down once more. Holmes stepped quickly over to him and rubbed the cloth firmly across and down his face. Let me introduce you, he shouted, to Mr. Neville St. Clair of Lee in Kent. The effect of Holmes's cloth was unbelievable. The skin of the man's face seemed to come off like paper, taking the twisted lip with it. Holmes took hold of the untidy red hair and pulled it off too. The ugly beggar had changed into a pale, sad-faced young gentleman with black hair and a smooth skin. He sat up in his bed and rubbed his eyes, looking round sleepily. Then he realized what had just happened, gave a terrible cry, and hid his face. Good heavens, cried Bradstreet, it certainly is the missing man. I recognize him from the photograph. By now, the prisoner had managed to control himself. And what, he asked, am I charged with? With being concerned in the disappearance of Mr. Neville St. Bradstreet began. But of course you can't be charged with that. Well, I have been a member of the police force for twenty-seven years, and I have never seen anything like this. If I am Neville St. Clair, no crime has been done. It is clear that you are breaking the law by keeping me here. No crime has been done said Holmes, but you bought to have trusted your wife. It was not my wife that I was worried about, it was the children. I didn't want them to be ashamed of their father, and what can I do now? Sherlock Holmes sat down beside him on the bed and touched his shoulder kindly. I advise you to tell everything to Mr. Bradstreet, he said. It may not be necessary for the case to come into court. Your story will probably never be mentioned in the newspapers. Your children need never find out about it. St. Clair gave him a grateful look. I will tell you the whole story. My father was a schoolmaster in Derbyshire, where I received an excellent education. I traveled a great deal after I left school. I was an actor for a time, and then became a reporter for an evening paper in London. One day I was asked to write a series of pieces about begging in London. It was then that all my adventures started. I decided that the best way of collecting facts would be to become a beggar myself, just for one day. When I was an actor, I had, of course, learned all the skills of makeup, and I now made good use of them. I painted my face and gave my upper lip an ugly twist so that people would pity me. Red hair and old clothes were the only other things necessary. I then placed myself in one of the busiest streets in London. I pretended to be a match seller, but I was really a beggar. I stayed there for seven hours. At home that evening, I was surprised to find that I had received more than a pound. I wrote my pieces and thought no more of the matter for some time. Then I signed my name on a paper for a friend who wanted to borrow some money. He was unable to pay his debt and so I found that I owed twenty-five pounds. I did not know what to do. Suddenly, I had an idea. I asked for two weeks' holiday, and spent the time begging in Three Needle Street. In ten days, 
I had the money and had paid the debt. Well, you can imagine how difficult it was to settle down to hard work on the newspaper at two pounds a week when I knew that I could earn as much as that in a single day. I only had to paint my face, put my cap on the ground, and sit still. Of course it hurt my pride to do it, but in the end, I gave up my post and sat day after day in the corner I had first chosen. My ugly face made everybody pity me, and my pockets quickly filled with money. Only one man knew my secret. This was the owner of the Bar of Gold in Upper Swandom Street, an Indian sailor. It was there that I changed myself into an ugly beggar each morning, and there that I became a well-dressed businessman again in the evenings. I paid the man well for his rooms, so I knew that my secret was safe with him. Well, very soon I realized that I was saving money fast. I do not mean that any beggar in the streets of London could earn seven or eight hundred pounds a year, but I had unusual advantages. My knowledge of makeup helped me a great deal, and my jokes quickly made me almost a public figure. All day and every day, the money poured into my cap. I usually received at least two pounds in a day. I was almost a rich man. I was able to take a large house in the country, and later to marry. Nobody had any idea where my money really came from. My dear wife knew that I had a business in London. That was all. Last Monday, I had finished for the day, and was dressing in my room in Upper Swandom Street when I saw my wife outside. She was looking up at me. This was a great shock to me, and I gave a cry of surprise and threw up my arms to cover my face. I rushed downstairs and begged the owner of the place to prevent anyone from coming up to me. Then I ran upstairs again, took off my clothes, and put on those of Hugh Boone. I heard my wife's voice downstairs, but I knew that she would not be able to come up. I put on my makeup and my false hair as fast as I could. Just then, I realized that the police might search my rooms. I did not want my own clothes to be found. I filled the coat pockets with coins and opened the window. I had cut my finger at home that morning, and the cut opened again. I threw the heavy coat out of the window and saw it disappear into the river. I would have thrown the other clothes out too. But just then I heard the policeman rushing up the stairs. A few minutes later, I was seized as my own murderer. But I was happy that nobody realized who I was. I was determined not to be recognized, and so I refused to wash my face. I knew that my wife would be very anxious about me, and I therefore slipped off my ring and found an opportunity to give it to the owner of the bar of gold, together with a short letter to her. Mrs. St. Clair did not get that note until yesterday, said Holmes. Good heavens, W. had a terrible week she must have had. The police have been watching the Indian, said Bradstreet, and he must have had great difficulty in posting the letter without being seen. He probably handed it to one of the sailors who come to the bar of gold to smoke opium. The man may have forgotten to post it until yesterday. I think you are right, said Holmes. Mr. St. Clair, have you never been charged with begging in the streets? Oh yes, I have often been to court, but I could easily afford the money I had to pay. Your life as a beggar must stop now, said Bradstreet. If Hugh Boone appears once more in the streets of London, we shall not be able to prevent the newspaper reporters from writing about the case. I swear never to beg again, said St. Clair. In that case, you will hear no more of the matter, said Bradstreet. But if you are ever found begging again, everything will have to be made public. Mr. Holmes, we are very grateful to you for your successful handling of the case. I wish I knew how you got your results. I found the explanation of this affair by sitting in a comfortable armchair and smoking my pipe all night, answered my friend. I think, Watson, that if we drive to Baker Street now, we shall be just in time for breakfast.